Welcome, everyone. Um, I just introduced myself. My name is Tracy Follows. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of JWT in London, um, and I am the new chair of the APG. And just before we carry on with that, I just wanted to um, pay my mark of respect to Craig Maudsley, who I'm sure you all know and was the previous um, chair of the APG. Unfortunately, he can't be here today because he's at an away day. So I have, I don't know about you, but I personally have visions of him getting stuck on some sort of zip wire in the Brecon beacons, just because that's very funny. Um, but I just wanted to say he did a fantastic job over the last two years of um, really uh, professionalizing the APG and uh, growing uh, growing the membership and working with Sarah, who I'm sure you all know, the director of the APG. He was very decisive, very unflappable, and he saw us through some quite demanding times, even when he was busy uh, pitching or he had a, the Sainsbury's Christmas campaign. I don't know if any of you saw it. S a small, it, it, you probably didn't notice it, um, uh, even when he had that on his plate. So he did a fantastic job, and uh, I just wanted to thank him and also say that I'm really looking forward to it. It's for two years, and I'm especially looking forward to working with the committee and to Sarah Newman, who is the director of the APG. So quick round of applause for Sarah and Craig for the fantastic job they do. So on to tonight, noisy thinking. And please do make it noisy. We will have a Q&A at the end. And we've got six speakers tonight, so it's going to be fast and furious. But before we start, I'd just like to thank Flamingo, who again have uh, agreed to sponsor us, sponsor Noisy Thinking. And you'll be hearing from Andy from Flamingo in a second. But thank you very much. And also to Nate and Google, again, for their hospitality, this fantastic venue. Thank you very much. Um, right. A bit about our speakers for the evening. Um, you may recognise or know or have read something from all of them, um, but we asked them to give us a little bit of insight into each of them, so hopefully that will help you get to know them a bit better. The first one up um, is going to be Andy Davidson. He's Head of UK Practice at Flamingo. And um, I hadn't met Andy before, so we went onto his LinkedIn site and had a laugh at his profile photo. Um, he goes to work in Lycra and a hard hat. I don't know what that means. Hopefully it's something to do with cycling. But he said, when, he, when we, we asked him, tell us something insightful about yourself, he said, I am proud of my achievements, but often feel that they are dwarfed by those of my younger motor racing superstar brother, leading to feelings of inadequacy. If only, if only there was some sort of public speaking opportunity that could act as a platform to catapult me to similar levels of stardom. Well, be careful what you wish for. So Andy's here tonight. Then Nick Hurst, who you may know, Joint Head of Planning at DARE. I've known Nick for a long time, since we were planners together at Lowe. He started in account management. Don't hold that against him. Um, he moved quite swiftly into the world of account planning, winning APG, IPA, CAN, and even the ADMAP SA Awards. He's just showing off. Um, David Wilding, Head of Planning at PhD in the Media Corner. So David is a media planner extraordinaire. Campaign love him. <laughs> He's been top, top planner 2011, Number three in 2012, what happened, David? I don't know. Anyway, and number two again in 2013. He's done lots of interesting um, things in the media world, in term, um, including advising the Labour Party on common strategy for the 2009 election. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, he says, of him, he says of himself, I live on the south coast. I have three amazing children, but I am burdened by a reliance on southwest trains and a hereditary affiliation with Wolverhampton Wanderers, both of which you can uh, occasionally find me grumbling about on Twitter. Now, I think there's something really odd going on at the APG, because I'm a Wolves fan, he's a Wolves fan, and so is Craig Maudsley. Um, that tells you more about the APG than you ever wanted to know. Um, Caitlin Ryan, we, it's fantastic to have Caitlin here. She's one of the busy, busiest women in town. Cafe owner, awards judge, ex-marketing consultant and responsible for the launch of HMV Direct. She's one of the very best creative directors in London at Karmarama. And she says of herself, I never knowingly say no. This is not always a good thing. <laughs> so we're very pleased that she said yes tonight. And we thank Caitlin for coming because she is incredibly busy. Very grateful. 
And last, but absolutely no means least, uh, John Griffiths, who I'm sure you all know, planning above and beyond. Um, I have the pleasure of helping um, John write a book at the moment, but even I didn't know some of these extraordinary facts, sorry, insights about him. You might know him as a researcher and an all-round uh, planning polymath, but did you know, of course you didn't, um, that he missed an opportunity to star as an extra in the film Chariots of Fire, just because he never turned up. You haven't explained what happened here. You just said, I missed, I missed the opportunity because I never turned up. They wanted me to have straight trousers and only own flares at the time. That That's was why. <laughs> um, he has been a sheep farmer and a milkman, not at the same time. And he once interviewed a mother and daughter with a monitor lizard in a cage right behind his head. He says, there were another 50 animals in and around the house. After the interview, their comment was, the lizard must like you. He's tried to attack everyone else who has sat in that chair. <laughs> you can't attack John. It's lovely. Anyway, thanks to all of them for, for speaking tonight. And they will, as I say, the, the format is they will come on and do 10 minutes or less on the question, what is an insight? So um, I'm going to kick it off um, and try and answer that extraordinarily difficult question. Have my first slide, please. Right, what is an insight? Well, <laughs> when we think of insights, gosh, it's a terrible photo, sorry. Um, when we think of insights, we tend to think of them as magical. They have a sense of wonder, wondrous, wonderful, um, because they seem to, as Bette Davis says here, unlock creativity in, in some kind of fashion. Is this working, this one? You're nodding. No, <laughs> that's why. Or, as Marshall McLuhan says, an insight is a lot more than just a point of difference. It isn't just that. And he's sort of grasping towards the idea of it being a kind of understanding that's at a very deep level. Um, gosh, without insight, things can be terrible, <laughs> according to Goethe. There is nothing so terrible as activity without insight. Well, that's particularly true for planners, I guess. Um, nobody wants to be doing anything that's terrible. And I guess that's why there's so many of you here tonight. But I think what's quite interesting about this question is that it made me think about the sort of codes of communication, if you like, that have contrived to make us think that uh, an insight is some kind of flash of inspiration, that it happens in a nanosecond, that it is some kind of... Um, yeah, flash, revelation, if you like. And often when we talk about ideas, or indeed insights, we see this kind of symbol. But I don't think that's the case. I think an insight is less to do with a, a revelation and is more to do with a realisation. Because actually, I think an insight is a lot slower than that. Um, and I remember Ed Morris saying to, to me once that when he went around the world and he looked at things and he was looking through the lens of creative insight, that it was like thinking in slow motion. And I think that's probably true. And so I think insights happen or work at a much slower speed. And insight is much more like thinking in slow motion. When you notice something. But that's not the insight. The insight is when you notice that you're noticing something. It's the noticing that you're noticing that is the insight, more of a realization than a revelation. So what is it that we're noticing, we're noticing? Is it something very, very normal, very everyday, very ordinary? Or is it something quite extraordinary? If that, is that what gets it noticed? Well, actually, I would argue that it's both. And for me, an insight is something that is weird, normal. Now, for those of you that know Gilbert and George, you'll know that they talk a lot about weird, normal. In fact, when they started out and they were thinking about the artist community, they said that there were a lot of artists who were dressing really weirdly, like so weirdly that they were alienating like 90% of the population. And worse, they couldn't get into restaurants. Um, and they decided that they were going to act so normally, I mean, so extremely normally, that actually it became a bit strange. So they talk about, we want to be weird normal. 
And that's what makes their sort of stuff work, and their, and their work is very insightful. But more than that, they say, we wanted to be normal, so normal, in fact, that it was a bit strange, normal and weird at the same time. That's our secret. So to use their words, they say, it's not good to be weird because all the silly artists are weird. It's not good to be normal because everybody is normal. But to be normal and weird is a very great secret in the mind. So what they're really talking about is, again, unlocking this creativity using weird normal to unlock creativity. And they get to it here, really. <laughs> they say, it's very important for us to be normal and weird at the same time because we can have original thought. It makes original thought possible. I think that's, that's very true. So when is weird normal an insight, and why is it such? Well, I think something strikes us when we come across weird normal, because our brains kind of try and make sense of it. It's an invitation to interpret, if you like. So we're looking for some kind of meet, meaning. We're trying to unscramble it. We know it's familiar in a kind of way, but it's also unfamiliar. And I think this is what Lewis Carroll really understood incredibly well. I mean, Alice and her adventures, <laughs> they're not ordinary, are they? They are not just plodding statements or crushingly obvious um, observations. They're just a series of anomalies that is inviting you, inviting your brain to unpick it and look for meaning. So how many pieces of string are, how long? <laughs> you know, quite weird normal. Right, so how do you recognise this insight? How do you recognise weird normal? I think, funnily enough, when we come across an insight, not always, but often, a weird normalness or an insight, it makes us laugh. Um, and I think that's what Larry David got absolutely right. Curb your enthusiasm is such a nuanced piece of interplay between what is normal and what is weird. And he understands all of the social conventions, but of course his character constantly acts in quite a weird way, even though they, and he understands normality. And I think it's this interplay between normalness and weirdness that makes us laugh, because we laugh at inappropriate things. We laugh when we know that something should be a certain way, it should be normal, but it's not, it's quite weird. Um, so inappropriateness is quite interesting. Same with Seinfeld, actually. I mean, on the face of it, this is a show which is, as you know, about absolutely nothing. But is it about absolutely nothing? Because again, I would say that actually, it's more this continuous interplay between weird and normal. These are a bunch of people who are, in a funny sort of way, uh, trying to answer the philosophical question about how should one live? Should one live normally within social conventions? Or should one live like Kramer completely weirdly? And actually, it's the juxtaposition of the two, the way they bounce off each other, the fact that normal and weirdness exist together that makes it so funny. So Seinfeld has a little stand-up routine, not from the show, but just on the stand-up routine about Pop-Tarts. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know about you, but I think they are weird and normal, right? Well, anybody who grew up in the 70s. Um, he has this little gag. Um, and rather than try and explain it or show you the stand-up, I'm going to let I'm going to show you a film that lets him explain it, and he'll talk to you about how the joke about the pop tart is constructed. And I hope that what you see in it is this constant interplay between weird and normal, and that that's what makes it insightful and that's what makes it funny. <coughs> Can you play the video? Thanks. In comedy, what you do is you think of something that you think is funny, and then you go from there. It's a fun thing to say, Pop-Tart. I like the first line to be funny right away. When I was a kid and they invented the Pop-Tart, the back of my head blew right off. And that, that got the whole thing started, that a specific part of my head blew off. Not just my head, but just the back. It was the 60s and we had toast. We had orange juice that was frozen years in advance that you had to hack away at with a knife to get a couple of drops and it felt like you were committing a murder before you got on your school bus. Then I talk about um, shredded wheat, which was like wrapping your lips around a wood chipper. You have breakfast and then you had to take two days off for the scars to heal so you could speak again. You were like uh, chimps in the dirt playing with sticks. What makes that joke is you got chimps dirt, playing, and sticks. 
In seven words, four of them are funny. Chimps, chimps are funny. <laughs> then there's the trying to figure out as a kid, how did they know that there would be a need for a frosted fruit filled heatable rectangle in the same shape as the box it comes in and with the same nutrition as the box it comes in. Then I had to figure out how to end the thing and that's the hardest part if you have a long bit the biggest laugh has to be at the end. It has to be. It can't be in the middle or the beginning and this was very daunting. Once this Pop-Tart had come into the world I didn't understand why we, why we were still eating other kinds of food because this seemed to be definitely the new way. Two in the packet and two slots in the toaster. Why two? One's not enough, three's too many. And they can't go stale because they were never fresh. <laughs> they can't go stale because they were never fresh. That was, that took a long time. And it, I know it sounds like nothing. And it is nothing. You know, in my world, the wronger something feels, the righter it is. So to waste this much time on something this stupid is, that's, that felt good to me. I, I just love that because the wronger something is, the writer it is, it's normal, it's weird at the same time. And he makes the point for me really that this sort of weird normal, it doesn't happen in a flash. It's quite a considered thoughtful thing and it takes a long time, it takes as long as it takes. And then finally, you know, you hope if you're lucky it's the right kind of insight, it engenders a response in, in someone. With comedy, obviously, you hope that someone will laugh. Um, but that's the way to construct it. So all I would say is that weird normal, look out for it on the way home. It's certainly all around. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think uh, Andy Davidson is on next. So Andy, Head of UK Practice at Flamingo, what is an insight? 